important as backdrop, and that is, of course, we're famous here for, for our great wilderness ecosystems and uh, intact wildlife communities. And these traits are, are due in part to the vast public lands that we have, and in general, low human population densities. But the population story, of course, is changing, and we're now shifting into um, rapid population growth, leading to land use change, intensification, uh, and some loss of natural habitats to homes, to suburbs. Um, strangely, we actually don't have uh, great knowledge about several aspects of this, like uh, how fast are we losing habitat? What's causing the loss? In other words, what are the driving factors? Um, which of the remaining habitats may be our most important priorities for conservation? Well, it might surprise you that uh, we actually understand some of this stuff better globally than in our region. Um, for example, rates of habitat loss and fragmentation have been quantified increasingly well. Um, this paper indicates a recent paper from colleagues and I that 42% um, of the terrestrial earth only is uh, is relatively free from human pressure, 42%. Um, and that amount continues to decline. But fortunately, policy um, at the global scale is, is fairly well developed. And as you probably know, um, there are targets for biodiversity for 2020, and, and new ones are being developed for 2030. And uh, almost 200 countries are part of that process. Um, how about the U.S.? Well, we, we have no national biodiversity policy. Uh, particularly for with regard to private lands. And uh, natural habitats on those private lands are not mapped at the fine scale that's needed for conservation planning. And we actually, as a consequence, don't know a whole bunch about how fast your habitat's being lost and, uh, and what's, what are the main factors that drive that loss. So, that led um, our group to, to pose these questions. Basically, what's the rate of conversion of natural habitats on private lands to other land uses? What are the key factors that might explain fast rates of loss in some parts of our region and slower rates in other parts? Um, Really importantly, where are those remaining natural habitats? Where are they? And uh, which ones are most at risk of, of loss now in the future? And then finally, um, can we come up with an objective way to, to prioritize these places with regard to uh, conservation importance? Um, so this evening, I'd like to uh, highlight some of these things that, that we've learned. Um, on a personal note, uh, I might mention that, that since my, my sons were little boys, we've, we've seen the area losing natural habitats, one parcel at a time. And I'm sure all of you uh, have observed the same thing. Uh, this, it's interesting because this, this piecemeal development happened despite our communities, just, you know, awesome science and conservation uh, legacy here. Um, in spite of the immense monetary resources that are now in the region and the, and the strong affinity that many folks here have for the outdoors. So my hope is that, uh, that this work contributes to conversations in our community and hopefully actions to better conserve these habitats. Uh, I know many of many of you that are that are joining us tonight are working in conservation. And uh, please, I would really appreciate any feedback you can provide me on how to make the work that I'll report tonight more relevant to your efforts 
so that you can actually put it to use. Uh, and before going on, I really would like to thank uh, Bruce and Madison and the Institute on Ecosystems for, for hosting the lecture tonight. I really appreciate it. And, uh, and I appreciate all of you joining in. So the study area includes uh, this region, pretty much the, uh, the Rocky Mountain portion of Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, and the full extents of Idaho, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. Most of this is public, uh, but the yellow is indicating where the private lands are. That's about 35% of the total. And these private lands include some of the most important places for biodiversity, even more important uh, than some of the public lands. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Of course, we, we mentioned that the area is now shifting into uh, a much faster population growth. And, and also, you're well aware that we're uh, in the process of many communities moving from Old West-based economies to New West economies that, that uh, deal more with service industries and technology um, and have relatively high levels of education, of wealth, of mobility. Of course, natural amenities are widely appreciated as important in the area, things like scenery, wildlife, open spaces. And in fact, these are thought to be uh, one of the major attractants for these New West immigrants, the people that are, that are now coming into the area at a rapid pace. So that raises pretty interesting questions about how do you keep those natural amenities um, in place as more and more people come to enjoy them? A question you all no, well, so Scott Powell and uh, and uh, Rachel Ehrlich, both from the Land Resources and Environmental Sciences Department, um, took the lead for us on this first question about just rates of change. Uh, they actually had to develop novel techniques to answer this question, and that's because while satellite data has been used to map the U.S., to map land cover across the U.S. now for several decades. Um, it's not able to detect individual homes and low-density residential development. It turns out that that, what we'll call rural residential development, is the fastest growing land use type in the U.S. Um, so, so Scott pioneered some methods to basically use um, high resolution imagery like this to map rural homes. For example, here's a set of uh, buildings and homes um, and also other land uses. And we did so in these one kilometer plots. We had some 618 of the plots across the study area and did analysis at five-year intervals from 1990 to 2010. The samples were placed to be stratified by hypothesized drivers of the change, allowing rigorous hypothesis testing on their influence on rates of development. So those strata included natural amenities, um, urban versus rural, new west versus old west, um, development level in terms of urban to rural and, um, and climate. And just the, some of the key results, um, we found that rural residential development increased nearly 50% 50, 50 in area during that 20-year period. Suburban area increased by 60% and urban by almost 20%. Uh, Croplands declined, um, grazing lands declined, but importantly, natural cover declined. Which land use types were developed into rural home sites? Well, that's what this is showing, the transition. And you can see that um, Natural cover was the main source of lands that were developed for rural homes, and then crops and grazing also were important contributors. And then 
In addition to just whether a plot was converted to a rural home, we are interested in the density of homes and how that's changed over time. And we can see that it's increased by almost 40, uh, just over 40% in the areas that, of rural residential development over that 20-year period. Um, and that home density has increased across all these land use types. Um, pretty clear indication of, you know, our landscapes are, are getting increasingly uh, uh, intensely used. So to summarize uh, this first question, um, we basically found that, that rural residential development was uh, covering a much larger area than previous satellite-based approaches had identified. And thus, it's probably underreported, not just in our area, but, but nationally. That it was the single, single largest uh, uh, type of land use in terms of change over time and largely uh, originated from natural cover and from agricultural classes, and that home density is up everywhere, including in rural places. Okay, now let's look at some of the results of the hypothesis testing with regard to drivers. This was led by Katrina. She's an economist out of U of M. Um, a bit of context. Land use studies have, have long asked this question of what are key drivers, and here are the the major types of factors that are found to influence land use change. Uh, proximity to markets, particularly large city markets, infrastructure like roads, um, airports, social and demographic factors, natural resource availability, mining, coal, timber, climate, and then natural amenities. We were particularly interested in the role of natural amenities uh, in this region because they, they, they're probably so relevant to rates of development of natural habitats. Um, we, we speculated that these natural amenities might be important at, at two scales, at the parcel scale or the plot scale where the, where the home site actually is, and then at the scale of the community that the home site is, is near to. Um, so we, we basically tried to ask to, uh, to determine probability of conversion of natural habitats to rural home sites um, by considering factors at both those scales, the plot scale and the community scale. Plot scale, community scale. So we developed um, predictors of land use change to be included in our hypothesis testing at these two scales, the plot scale. And then this depicts the community scale, what we're calling city sphere. And it's basically a, a 40 minute commute time around urban centers. So this is an approximation of the Bozeman city sphere for this study with um, Bozeman in the middle here, of course, and the sphere extending to Manhattan, to Big Sky, to Livingston. Um, the predictors included several related to natural amenities, to infrastructure, to um, market proximity, to, the, to New West, Old West demography, to climate and to population. And, and each of these was, was at either the plot scale or the city sphere your scale or both. And then Katrina largely used a rather sophisticated um, hierarchical econometric statistical models for doing this analysis. Um, here are some of the findings. The best model, in fact, did include both the plot level and the city sphere level predictors. It was a reasonably strong model explaining about 50% of the variation in probability of development. Um, not surprisingly, at the, at the scale of 
the, the plot. Um, access to highways was an important predictor. And um, proximity to previous development, other homes and roads and so forth. But in terms of natural amenities, they scored as well with uh, proximity to public land and lakes being important in the model. And also uh, sites that had a mix of forest and non-forest, in other words, forest edge, which we think probably is a, an important correlate or predictor of um, scenic quality. And then at the level of the communities, the city spheres, uh, those closer to major urban markets had higher probability of development. In terms of natural amenities, um, proximity to national parks and other public lands were important. And uh, being within two hours of a ski resort were, were, were important. So how strong were these effects? Uh, we can get one feel for that through through this graphic. So we have probability of, of a plot being developed in these three zones around cities from transition from urban to suburban, suburban to um, exurban and then rural. That's what these three bars are indicating. And, uh, and then shown here are basically are locations where natural amenities are high, both at the plot or parcel level and at the community level. And those locations are, um, are close to markets. And you can see that they were reasonably rapid. Uh, there's reasonably high probability of development for those types of locations. Um, interestingly, that's also true for places that are high in amenities, but remote from markets. So that would be places like Cody, Wyoming, for example, um, that are a long way from, uh, from the sort of uh, major cities and, and transportation hubs and so forth. Um, and then on the other hand, places that are low in amenities have way lower probability of development, particularly those that are just almost no probability of development. So that tells us quite a bit. Um, so the conclusions we would draw from this is that it's complex which, which particular locations are likely to develop. It depends both on, on the site itself, but also the characteristics of the community that are, that are close by. Um, and natural amenities are important at both scales, um, but that's true not only close to urban markets and major transportation corridors, but also in places more remote from that. And uh, the Wall Street Journal has already beat me to the punch on this with, uh, with uh, an article recently about uh, patterns of development in these sort of high natural amenity communities. Okay, to move to uh, for a third question, um, as ecologists, Dave Theobald and I were interested in how, how this land use change influences natural habitats that matter to, to real species and to ecological processes. So we ask about uh, basically what's the current distribution of those remaining natural habitats and what are the rates of loss? So natural habitats on private lands, uh, I'm sure you're trying to get your head around that. Um, turns out they're really important. They're often more valuable for biodiversity than many places in public lands. Um, and that's true because they're often at lower elevations. The soil is good. The climate is good. Water's available. Um, and just to illustrate, you, you may have remember that Jay Rotel and I did work on this uh, in the Gallatin watershed some years ago. So Bozeman is sitting over here, and this is the Gallatin Front, the Gallatin National Forest Boundary, and then Yellowstone National Park. So we're kind of looking to the south here. The red are, are bird hotspots, places of particularly high native bird species richness. And where are they? Well, they're mostly down in the private lands and right in the edge of the National Forest. And they're mostly not up in Yellowstone Park because of the climate, the soils, um, the water availability. 
Um, so that's speaking to the importance of these private lands. We, we focus particularly on, on natural vegetation cover as our main response variable. So these are places where native vegetation is dominant and, uh, and there's no discernible, um, more intense human land uses. So how to map that? Um, as I said, this USGS National Land Cover data set doesn't quite get there. And we can, that's illustrated here in this graphic. So this is the neighborhood just south of the Big Sky Turnoff, on, and this is Highway 191 and the Gallatin River. So north is up this way, and uh, I think Ofer School is just down here. But these are um, dense subdivisions close to the highway, and then of course rural homes uh, spread out in the forest to the west. Notice that the national data layer gets the more dense development right. This pink is labeled as developed, but those rural homes. Um, are not detected. They're labeled largely as national as natural forest. So this is an example of missing this really important habitat type uh, or land use type. Now, fortunately, Dave Theobald has developed um, a national land use data set that was particularly designed to get this low density development. And so this orangish color is that class. He calls it residential exurban low. And you can see that, in fact, it does pick up this area. Now, one of the reasons why Dave really worked hard to get that uh, is because it really matters ecologically if there's a home in proximity or not. And that's because Many species, for example, tend to um, be distributed along the gradient from wildlands through agricultural lands, exurban, suburban, and urban, with native species and top predators being uh, highest in numbers of species in those more natural parts of the landscape. And the human dominated parts being uh, having a greater proportion of weedy species and invasive species and species like crows and magpies that do well around people and are turned out to be predators on many native species. That might be why if you live in the south side in Bozeman, you pretty much have zero or maybe two native bird species in your backyard, but thousands of magpies. Um, that results in um, Basically, a rural home or a rural subdivision. So this is a little bear subdivision. My family used to live, let's see, right about here. Um, basically, is ringed with these various alterations of, of species and ecological processes. So this is just sort of a cartoon of, of the various types of influences of, of the homes and subdivisions on the surrounding area. And these, these effects can extend for hundreds of yards to, uh, to a kilometer or more. So there's basically an aura around each home site um, that influences habitat quality. Okay, so we basically drew on both the, um, the USGS data sets and Dave's new data set to map natural vegetation cover uh, as well as all these developed layers, we just call them developed, and then crop agriculture. So three classes are really what we were trying to, to get at. Okay, so what did, we, what did we find through this mapping? Well, tier to my knowledge is the first map produced of natural vegetation cover on private lands across the study region. Um, Basically, what it, it's it's this uh, yellowish color that's showing those. Let's see, it's the uh, sorry. So of course, it's the greenish color that's showing the uh, the 
So what we're seeing here basically are those three classes with, with the remaining natural vegetation cover shown in green and the croplands in yellow and then the developed lands in black. Um, and there's a surprising large amount of these private lands that remain in, in natural, natural cover. Um, approximately 62% of the private lands are in this class. Uh, you can see that it varies a lot in terms of the area that it covers among these ecoregions, with the Blue Mountains, for example, being some 86% of the private lands in this natural category. But in Western Washington, it's only 22% that remain in that, uh, in that condition. This map is showing um, natural vegetation cover in darker green on the private lands and in lighter green on the public lands. And I'm showing this to, to help us put in context the role of these private natural areas um, in, in a region that has a lot of public land. So, so we see that in parts of our region, for example, in uh, Eastern Oregon and Washington, Central and Eastern Oregon and Washington, um, these natural habitats are the pretty much the only habitats. There's not federal land in that region. And uh, these maps suggest that the, these, these private natural areas might really be quite important for connectivity between, for example, the Rocky Mountains and the Cascade Mountains. And then in our region, similarly, um, important for connectivity between the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and the crown of the continent ecosystem. So this is pretty much the Bridger Big Belt sequence of, of mountains right up through here. And note, note the, a lot of it's private um, and still in a natural condition. And then of course, in the Colorado, mountains, um, there's quite large areas of private lands that are still in a natural condition. Uh, shown in red here are the places that were converted from natural vegetation cover to developed classes during this 2001 to 2011 period. Um, I should have mentioned that it's only these two years, 2001-2011, that we have both the Theobald data and the, the other uh, USGS data set. So the results for this part of the talk deal with that 10 year period. Um, how much did we lose over that decade? Well, across the whole study area, about only two and a half percent of the places that were natural at the start of the decade. But again, um, those loss rates vary quite substantially. Um, and so, for example, if we zoom in on some locations, we see uh, much higher rates of loss. So the Spokane Coeur d'Alene area um, was one region where there were much higher rates, up to uh, about 8% um, loss during that decade. And then the area around Bend, Oregon was uh, six to seven percent of, of those natural areas were converted. And then Bozeman, Big Sky, Paradise Valley, um, also places of relatively high conversion. And, and those locations, of course, are indicated in this broader study area map. Uh, here's just an example. You drive over uh, Bozeman Pass all the time, 990. Well, the area pretty much between Bozeman Pass to the north and Trail Creek to the south is, uh, is the real deal. <laughs> There's homes everywhere up there and roads. Um, and of course, we see this as one of the major corridors uh, between Yellowstone and Glacier. Is it really functioning that way with this level of development? Uh, so this, this stuff is real. 
Okay, so due to, due to the findings about the importance of communities, of city spheres, we did, we were interested in analyzing basically what are the rates of habitat loss in, in and around uh, the different medium and, and sized and large sized cities of the region. Um, so these are the 88 city spheres from our analysis. And shown here are the rates of loss on a per resident basis. Um, so for each resident in 2011, how much natural habitat was converted to development in the previous decade. And the darker colored ones had the higher rates. Um, so here are the top 20. So Primeville, Oregon is right up top. That's a small community right aside of Bend. Um, you see several in our region that are relatively high. How about our fair city of Bozeman being number eight out of 88 in terms of uh, per capita habitat loss? So can we get our heads around that? That's us. Um, and again, we, we did analysis to figure out what are the characteristics of, of, of places that, that had this development at both plot level and city sphere level. And so, for example, just to, to focus on the city sphere, um, basically, uh, cities that were more remote from markets, so away from the Portlands and Seattles, had higher rates. Those that were um, more new west and, and less so old west, those that um, had development underway at the start of the, the decade, um, were close to national parks and had a lot of topographic complexity suggesting again, scenic quality. So it's the same theme of, uh, of things we know influence growth everywhere, distance from markets, um, but also this conversion to high tech and service and higher education um, and some natural amenities variables that are all correlating with these cities that that have the higher per capita rates of development. <clears throat> we use that, that statistical analysis then to, to basically um, model the probability of development based on 2010 conditions as a function of those predictors like natural amenities and urban remoteness. So here are the, here are the places that were still natural and 2011, um, but that have that are predicted to have a high probability of loss in the subsequent decades. So those places in red, and uh, it's a lot of places, isn't it? Particularly west of the Cascades, the Spokane, Coeur d'Alene area, um, the Boise area, Salt Lake area, Colorado mountains. Uh, these are all places where conversion is likely to be substantial. So summary statements on, on this uh, set of, of results. Um, we still have a lot of, of natural areas that, on these private lands, um, yet they're being lost to development. Um, it's particularly interesting that the loss rates are, are especially high in these new West communities that we think have the highest motivation because a lot of people came for the good nature for conservation and capacity to do conservation because a lot of folks um, have the resources and the social capital uh, to do conservation. Um, we, we have to take the current period into account. We know that there's just a housing boom going on right now during the COVID era. And some of it's fueled by climate change as well with all the fires. Um, we, we have to expect that the pressure to develop these lands 
is, is, is growing rapidly. Um, and then I've, I've hinted at and sort of focused on the importance for biodiversity of conserving these remaining natural places. But there's a lot of other reasons for conservation of these places. Of course, one of them is to try to reduce development in the wildland urban interface in order to try to save lives and homes under expanded fire regimes. This is, a, this is that same Little Bear subdivision, the fire we had in the year 2000, really the first of, of the fires threatening rural homes in the region was right there. And it's, we have many, many since. Of course, there's a high cost of government services to homes out in the wildland urban interface. And so reducing development there reduces cost to government. And then by not deforesting those places, we were able to store more carbon and, and hopefully contribute to reducing the climate change that has been driving these changes in fires. Okay, so for the last uh, question we'd like to address, um, I'd like to show you work that was done by uh, Nathaniel Robinson. He's uh, out of U of M and now with a private uh, wildlife firm, Pantera, and then Holly East, who's here in the ecology department, uh, and myself. And this, this was largely aimed at, can we use this type of information to objectively map which places perhaps are most important for conservation. Um, we're, we're really fortunate to be in a region where there are many land trusts and local government entities that have very active programs for protecting natural habitats through conservation, conservation easements and open space bonds. Um, yet objective information to guide their decisions is often uh, lacking. And so we were basically interested in trying to develop the data sets that would allow for objective ranking of conservation priority based on two things, ecological value and risk of loss. And then to make these results available to the people that are making those decisions. Okay, so for ecological value, um, we largely drew on available high quality national data sets. And those included um, metrics of net primary productivity, of how well ecosystem types are represented within protected areas or not, number of vertebrate species in a place, the number of imperiled species in a place, and then connectivity among large protected area ecosystems like Greater Yellowstone and, and uh, Crown of the Continent, for example. Um, this last one was not available nationally, and so we, we did that analysis ourselves. And then we used the risk of loss results from the from the uh, modeling that I showed a few minutes ago. And then for both ecological value and risk of loss, we basically converted the absolute values into relative values on a scale of one to 20, basically saying how, how well does a place score in terms of all places in the study area? As, and, and then also we did the same thing within ecoregions so that a given parcel would be evaluated in terms of its uniqueness across the entire Northwest study area and its value just within that particular ecoregion relative to other places in that ecoregion. Here, uh, here are the resulting maps for those metrics of ecological value. Um, Let's not take time to, to discuss the patterns in detail. They tend to vary somewhat between these different metrics. They're all, these maps are fascinating to look at. Um, here's the mean among all five values. We're calling it our ecological value index. Um, and again, it's, it's interesting. Places west of the Cascades score high. 
uh, these areas in generally southern southern areas score relatively high, particularly in the Wasatch Front area and the Colorado Mountains. And then here's that map of probability of development. And now what we're going to do is put these two together into really the product we were we've been working towards for five years, and that's this map of conservation priority. Um, so these are the places that, based on our our reading of the best ways in conservation science to do this, the places that are very high priorities. Um, again, west of the Cascades, the Spokane area and to the north, um, Boise area, Wasatch Front area, Colorado Mountains, our area to some extent. Um, so these are the scores for relative value across the whole study area. And then these are the scores for just our ecoregion with the map focused on Bozeman. Uh, and for us locally, I, again, this is this is a this is a map really important to look at. Um, you know, it's showing pretty much the the uh, the lower tree line forests being really important on the Gallatin front on both sides of the Bridger Range, um, the Bozeman Pass um, area being really important. Um, many places around Big Sky. Paradise Valley. Um, we hope, you know, we, we really hope that this this sort of map and, and the other ones I showed now become useful to folks. And so to wrap this up, um, I would just say that that we did this work really not much, not for the science products, not for the publications, but but because we just really thought it was important to get this objective information out to people that can use it. Um, it's it's really uh, it's both um, disturbing but also heartening that these highest rates of loss per capita are around communities like Missoula and Bozeman. Um, these are the communities that maybe really have the ability to start doing things differently and sustaining these remaining natural habitats. And so I would just end, you know, with this, this question to you all and to our broader community. How can we best preserve these important places before the, the natural heritage that we also value um, is further degraded? I really think that's the challenge that is in front of us. And with that, um, I'd really like to thank again Bruce and Madison and the Institute on Ecosystems for this talk, for this uh, lecture opportunity, and then the funding sources from a couple different NASA programs. And uh, again, thank you all so much for your attention. Well, thank well, you, then. Andy. And uh, uh, here's an applause. <laughs> uh, I'm so we'll open it up to some questions now and so if you um I think the best thing to do is to either place it in chat is that is that what you would like to see Madison I would say place it in chat we unfortunately the hand the raise hand just use the yeah. um but you can put it in chat and then I can see can direct to you um directly and you can unmute and ask your question at that point. Yeah, good. Well, I have a question to start us off perhaps to, to get things moving. Um, so when you're quantifying habitat loss, Andy, and you kind of touched on this, but is it fair to offset those losses with gains from conservation easements? In other words, what is the equality there? It seems to me that conservation easements are put on usually, um, you know, lands that have been managed for a long time, usually for for cattle grazing and things like that. So, I mean, is can that can that be used? Is there any offset there? I noticed that when you were showing your data or quantifying your your losses, that you didn't 
indicate that there was any um, any positive side to that or any trade-off side, perhaps. Can you address that a little bit? How much of uh, how much of those lands and conservation easements would be mapped as natural vegetation cover and, and included in the analysis? Uh, you, you're probably suggesting that some some of them would be labeled as developed, and yet they're being managed um, in ways that are favoring native species and so forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean that. That's basically it. Well, it's a it's it's a good point. We um, we could we we can take take into account the areas that have been placed in easements, and uh, you know those are those are well mapped nationally. And the year that they were um, put in easements, we're we're in fact quite interested in in uh, in a subsequent analysis of uh, basically asking. Um, have the easements been placed in areas that we would map as of high value ecologically or of high risk of loss? So in general, of course, the, um, the use of easements has been a massively important and successful um, conservation effort in Montana in particular and across the West. Um, and so it's doing exactly what is needed uh, to conserve these areas. Uh, and we're largely just, you know, trying to provide data that would support that further. Um, so I, th I think your point's well taken and, and it's important. Thanks. Awesome. Well, we've got um, questions coming into the chat, so I'll go ahead and start moving through those. Um, our first one comes from Robert Edwards, and he asks, the pressure for rural development is only going to increase. Is there a way to influence rural development to preserve or even enhance ecological value rather than have it always be negative? So, yeah, absolutely yes. And... Uh, There, there's really there's really great opportunity. You know, there's kind of there's kind of two major venues in conservation. One is to to protect it so that it's off limits to people, and the other is for people to use it in ways that um, have a soft touch ecologically and even a benefit. And uh, and, and the latter one is, you know, that's what we have available to us on private lands, basically incentives and education-based approaches. So there's tremendous opportunity to try to provide information to, um, to ex-urban homeowners as to how to minimize those ecological impacts that I showed in that graphic. Um, through controlling, you know, keeping their pets on leash and not letting them roam, or through weed management, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's great opportunities within cities for promoting native species. Um, even, you know, even for outdoor recreationalists, of course, we know that there's, there's ways to have a lighter touch when camping or mountain biking or skiing or snowmobiling or a heavier touch. Um, and so basically thinking about a way to, to develop a best practices guide for each of these types of activities, large ranch owners, ex-urban homeowners, backcountry recreationalists, uh, city dwellers, that would be a really helpful way to, for people to, to know how to have a lighter touch if they, if they want to. So I see tremendous opportunity for going that direction. Thanks for that question. Awesome. Well, I'll go ahead and move to our next one. Um, it's from Nathan Korb, and he says, I appreciate the examination of private lands, very helpful to prioritizing most vulnerable and high value areas. How do you consider climate change effects changing the fundamental drivers of biodiversity and land use change? 
Yes. So the hard part about all this is that, you know, these issues are really complex and the scientific analyses that are needed that underlay them are really complex. Um, and it's, it's, that can tend to really overwhelm the usability of the results. So uh, your, your eyes probably glazed over plenty with uh, whatever the multi data layers that we showed here in analyses. We chose not to include climate change in this analysis um, to keep it tractable for communication to stakeholders. And we wanted to get a start for current conditions. Um, really what what's it would be an important next step is in fact to, to look at how climate change would affect um, connectivity, would affect water availability and possibly land use change, affect fire regimes, et cetera. Um, it turns out, you know, some, some organizations are doing that. The Nature Conservancy is, has, uh, is probably a leader in coming up with a variety of conservation products that do climate change sensitivity analyses. Um, so really important, but we chose not to go to that next level of detail in these analyses because we wanted, we wanted to make a first step and try to produce tractable, usable products. Okay. Um, our next question comes from Todd Wilkinson and he asks, what were the factors in your assessment that involved a location due to density of development or landscape fragmentation reaching a point of no return in terms of biodiversity loss? Uh, yeah, we, well, we didn't go there, of course. Um, so specifically, that, those studies we did on birds in Yellowstone that I mentioned that I showed the map of, as Todd probably knows, we we basically address this question there. We ask what level of land use change would cause a native bird species population to, to go negative and decline to local extinction versus remain viable. Um, and we found that there were very narrow uh, ranges of land use that can either keep the population viable or put it into a tailspin. And then um, the grizzly bear study team uh, did the same type of analysis for, for grizzly bears in the Yellowstone recovery zone versus in the surrounding private lands. And they pretty much found that the population growth was negative outside of the recovery zone. Um, as a function of mortality due to cars and uh, car fatalities and, and other bear control measures from bear run-ins with people. Um, there's a lot of work in conservation science to identify those sorts of thresholds with regard to fragmentation levels, with regard to changes in disturbance regimes, with regard to um, weed populations becoming too large to control climate change thresholds. Um, again, that's a level of, of analysis beyond what you've got here. It's, it's an important one for, uh, for our region um, because basically, as, as Todd has written, we're seeing sort of change by a thousand cuts. We're seeing the wildlands being removed piece by piece, and yet it seems like the whole thing is viable. But is there a point at which it all collapses? And uh, we we know how to do that those analyses with regards to individual populations and a few and nutrient cycling and a few things. But when it comes to is this a place I still love as much as I used to or not? 
is this still the place that I really you know, want to be? Is Yellowstone still a big wild system? That's where there's lots of intangibles and it's, a, it's all personal decisions. And uh, again, that's why I think a conversation is important to, to get multiple perspectives on how much, how much development do we want to see in a place like Greater Yellowstone? Um, and how much do we want to keep it in a wild condition? Those are the conversations that Todd's journal is, is, really, is really forwarding and, and we all need to have. Uh, and it's really important because, you know, if you just, the Bozeman Chronicle, for example, when we talk about population growth, it's all about, you know, really important things like affordable housing. Um, but there's never anything about to what extent is connectivity between Yellowstone and Glacier being reduced by each new subdivision? And to what extent are we maintaining um, natural habitats and private lands? Um, Anyway, the, those are con those are components of conversations. I, I think we really need to have. And Todd, thanks for for that question and raising that topic. Great. Mm -hmm. um, we our next question comes from Sarah. Um, she asks for those of us who own small parcels of land in the areas that are within important locations surrounding Bozeman, like the foothills. Are there any things we can do to manage our property to support the surrounding ecosystem? Yeah, nice. Bruce, how would you answer that? Hell yes! What, what are they? <laughs> it's what are some of them? <laughs> well, I... I I would just add, and, and, I, and I'm trying to set you up here for for the answer that you you might ask is the you know the recent fire in Bridger the Bridger fire is really an interesting um, event, and I think it brought to life a lot of people thinking about long term management of their landscapes, and and uh, I know I've interacted with a number of landowners in Bridger Canyon about what do we do. Um, how should we uh, conserve this, but maybe at the same time, preserve some of the uh, activities and objectives on those landscapes. So maybe with that, you could you could add to that, uh, uh, that is being similar kind of question, because I think it's bringing to a head, a lot of people are asking these kinds of questions, but when a big event like that happens, then they get real serious about what should I do? And I think there's a real there's a real opportunity to uh, for MSU to contribute to uh, doing workshops and our extension service helping with with basically again how small landowners might um, might try to manage lands to maintain the uh, importance of their property and in in, in its role in the larger ecosystem. And Mike Clark and I and have talked at great length about that opportunity for large ranch owners. And Whitney Tilt's nice uh, writings here recently with regard to wildlife and large ranches is, is a really great example of, uh, of trying to come up with strategies to maintain wildlife while maintaining livelihoods. So again, I, I think there's a lot of kind of common sense things that we can do, but each of us only knows a few of them. And by sort of doing some some co-learning, I think we can we could do well to, to come up with a nice list and, and try to put them into practice. Any follow up, Bruce? <laughs> that. Well, I, I I agree completely with that. I mean, I, I think that that maybe most important is for people to uh, join with adjacent landowners and thinking about what is the context of their their in holding with, with others that are in their area and how might they jointly manage. I mean, this has been something that we think about at larger scale, certainly. 
um, as we start to re started to realize that the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem, for example, didn't it didn't end at the borders of Yellowstone, <laughs> and, uh, and and realize that it was much bigger. But really, that occurs at very small scales as well. If you start to talk about population dynamics of, of critical or vital species, um, even in a small landholding, you could probably um, I do a lot to conserve certain species. So, you know, it, it, th those are things that, that are going to be quite site specific, but I think thinking of your landscape in the context of a greater landscape and how you might get together with your neighbors to start thinking about how you jointly could manage for some things is a, would be the wisest thing to do. Yeah, good point. Okay, we um questions in here. The next one is coming from Brent Brock, and he asks, as usual, you presented a plethora of data products useful for, useful for prioritizing conservation at many levels. How will these data be shared in addition to publication? Yeah, thanks, Brock. So we've been using uh, a, a data storage system that you probably uh, are pretty familiar with, uh, FigShare. Um, so it's a public repository that um, that's open to anybody to access, and it requires documenting the data sets well. So uh, that's where we'll be posting the data. We're not we're not quite there yet. Um, we'll also be posting the Google Earth Engine code that I know you're using um, using that software, so that. Um, so that folks could modify some of the some of the analysis, change change the way that, for example, ecological value was was derived, or add another layer to that. So both the data that I showed and the code will be posted. And uh, if 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 you want access before we get it posted, just let me know. And we can we can get files to you. Good. Uh, let's, let's have one more question, and then we'll, we'll uh, adjourn. Perfect. It looks like um, from Jeff. He asks to Todd Wilkinson's point: At what point do you give up on Bozeman and focus on Paradise Valley, knowing that as the Bozeman metropolis extends over to Livingston, the distance from Paradise Valley to Livingston starts to meet your criteria of high chance of development? So again, that's quite a thought-provoking question, and I suspect you know different land trusts would answer it differently. Um, and I and I think from what you know from what I know about the conservation easement process, there's there's many many different types of criteria that go into a decision um, beyond the ones that I talked about, like ecological value or risk of loss. Um, in total, you know, I think it's I think it's hard to have a triage strategy. I think it's hard to give up on certain places. And one could well argue that we ought to have, we ought to strive towards conservation from urban centers right through the land use gradient to the wildest places. Um, because often those more people places have unique ecological values, but also uh, they're really important for people's well being to have access to nature. Um, and in addition to to people's well-being, there's the whole educational aspect of the benefits of, of people being able to get into nature. So, again, I think it's a really good question. I, I think I think there's real, you know, I think there's real potential to try to to have a, a cohesive conservation strategy for private lands that that would deal with the kind of question you raise and the issues of connectivity um, and educational value. It'd be really kind of interesting to, 
to see what a team would put together of sociologists and ecologists and geographers and political scientists. What would be, you know, if if the United Nations is coordinating a global biodiversity plan, what would a greater Yellowstone biodiversity plan look like? What would it recommend as priorities for, for private lands? Um, that's the direction that I, you know, I'd love to see us all take this. Okay, well, thanks for that. I know we're getting late. Well, thank you very much, Andy. This is a, this was a great session and I appreciate your uh, answering the questions and, and the presentation was, was quite informative. So thank you all. Uh, keep an eye out for, for the, the next uh, uh, guest lecture that we will sponsor. And I will uh, let you know that our Rough Cut uh, series will um, continue, but we'll, we'll have a bye week this week. But starting next week again, um, we'll be back at 12 noon and on Wednesdays for Rough Cut Seminars. So please join us then and you can find the connection at our website. Thank you all for coming and thank you again, Andy. Thanks, everybody. See you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.